morning everybody BTC Simmer here with you how's everyone doing afternoon good evening no matter where you may be watching here in Rust we're gonna run over to the Citadel have a look see if anyone's there um, Bitcoin 2023 is about to start Saturday here um, price BTC for now 26.950 US dollars 36.163 Americano remember guys one BTC is one BTC Long and low time preference. Long and low time preference. That's what Bitcoin is. All right, generational stacking leads to generational wealth. And if you have an emergency, you know your properly stored Bitcoin will be there and cannot be co-opted by anybody. It's properly stored. All right, a few headlines here. U.S. lawmakers oppose Biden's mining tax. Advocate for the use. Advocate for the use of BTC. All right, that's good. That's from today. Q News. Tax, mining tax, tax here, tax there. There's enough taxes. There, there never was taxes before the 19th century, and I don't see why we have any today. <laughs> so can someone please help me and show me how? Show me why? All right, anyway. Uh, Bitcoin gained 0.35% at 26,835 after 5 p.m. yesterday. That's Dow Jones Newswires. Um, I had another one here. Breaking Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to accept campaign donations in Bitcoin. How cool is that? That's from Cointelegraph. Okay, guys, let's get going here. Uh, wired in some lights. I'll show you them quickly here. I'm just all wired to one switch here. This is expensive to keep this armored. High quality metal. Very expensive. All right, come up here, show you some more lights. Got a light up in the tool area here. Um, probably drop this here, this here, doing arranging again, sorry guys. <laughs> anyway, let's get going. Made a little battery room, extra large battery, and we got a light up there as well. Make sure that's shut. We got the Christmas lights strung up here and along the front. They were, yeah, they're still there. Pretty sweet, eh? Hey? All right, we got fuel. Yeah, we got fuel. We got Joe Nakamoto, Coin Morning, How are you doing? Filmmaker, charming, wonderful man, well dressed. Uh, just, <laughs> just a nice guy. Got to hang out with him the last couple of days. It's been wonderful. And then to our far left, the myth, uh, Luke Radowski. Uh, wonderful, wonderful journalist. Incredible guy. Uh, we are changed. The best political shirts. A uh, bunch of amazing things. A lot of time on the Cumcast IRL. Uh, and just a, a wonderful, wonderful man and a great journalist. So we're uh, here to talk about journalism, a little bit about Bitcoin, but a lot about journalism. And uh, 
wanted to start with Whitney. Um, Whitney, you have been picking at this grander thing for a long time across these books, across these podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, you're sort of picking at this thread that keeps unraveling and we keep learning more and more about uh, you know, the things that are going on behind the, the, uh, the curtain. So I was just kind of curious where it started and where was this, uh, this thread picking kind of came from and what, what has sent you down this path? All right, so there's a lot of different ways to answer this question, I guess, because it didn't really start any one way. But um, I guess I got really frustrated once I started figuring out that the history we're taught in school, I went to a public school, isn't exactly what happened, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, I got really frustrated that, you know, my family is very invested in the official version of events, the official version of history. And, um, you know, I was on a podcast a couple days ago, uh, the, the PBD podcast, and was talking about my grandparents, who I was really close to. I mean, they practically raised me, and they loved America. They really believed in what I would call the Disneyland version <laughs> of what, you know, America actually is, how power actually functions, uh, things like that. And, you know, I'm, you know, I really wish they were still here, but in a sense, I'm glad they don't have to see how far this country has fallen and where it is heading uh, because they would be really devastated uh, because of everything they invested and in, in sacrificed for this country and I think that's true of a lot of other people's families and you know that's obviously not unique to me but um, I really feel that it's important to raise awareness about the reality of the situation because we'll never be if we have a fake Disneyland version of, of you know of events and we have, then we have a Disneyland version or vision of what the problem is and we'll never actually be able to solve any of the problems if we have this fake view of um, what the problem is we can't offer any real solutions you know I do know wonderful answer yeah that's great oh. uh, Joe, being in the Bitcoin space and a journalist in the Bitcoin space, I was very curious how you personally balance your bias. Uh, you know, obviously there's a big financial incentive and bias within Bitcoin. And how do you balance your bias as a journalist uh, and communicate that to your readers and, and viewers that, uh, you know, yes, I invest in Bitcoin, but uh, I'm going to tell the truth regardless and, uh, you know, do the right thing. What bias? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, also the idea of being uh, invested in Bitcoin, I, I got the instructions wrong and I'm just only half Bitcoin. Um, but I make that very clear on all my sort of social media profiles. And, you know, I, I go by the pseudonym Joe Nakamoto and the only Nakamoto, well, the, the, the no Nakamoto that this room knows is obviously Satoshi Nakamoto. So it's very evident that I'm obviously a Bitcoin advocate, Bitcoin believer. And I think that's okay to have, you know, these these biases, because everyone has a bias regardless of where you come from. It's a question of being aware of it and understanding, okay, where's that coming from? So, I guess personally, um, the readership, you know, I'm, I obviously work for Cointelegraph, which is a crypto journal. Right. And that, sorry, trigger word, a cryptocurrency <laughs> journal. Um, and inevitably within that space, you know, there's a lot of people that are pro other coins. So I think I have to be even more clear that, you know, right. when you're reading my work or you're watching my reports and documentaries, it's gonna have this Bitcoin focus. For sure. And I'm, I guess, in a way, trying to own that and you know, show that as well. Totally, yeah, and that understanding, you know, Bitcoin really is the, the state change here. It really is the revolution. And yeah, yeah. push that forward for sure. Very cool. Luke, my man. Something that I've always really resonated with your work from the get-go, and I've been following you now for, uh, I don't know, at least probably a decade, I think. Uh, with your, uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street and We Are Change things. I think something that really resonates with, with folks is that you, you really bring your bias and your emotions and your, your personal uh, chutzpah into your work, and it's very obvious. And uh, I think uh, it, it really helps to, uh, you know, to engage with people when you are being very emotionally honest and visceral. And I was just kind of curious how you feel about, yeah, kind of balancing your... your uh, your fieriness with uh, your journalism. Yeah, I believe this whole point of view of unbiased journalism is bullshit. It's mm. not true. Everyone has a bias. Everyone has an experience that they win in their life that affects them, especially when they're doing things like nitpicking little facts and details of what is allegedly true and not true. So 
instead of just trying to be objective, you embrace who you really are and you're honest and transparent about it and you're able to provide a point of view that's a lot more realistic, that, that's a lot more authentic than a lot of the corporate bull crap out there that is pretending to be something that they're not. So obviously emotions are gonna come through when I'm dealing with something like in the beginning of my career on 9-11 with a lot of the survivors and rescue workers, specifically the people who were lied to by the government and told that the air was safe to breathe and then they were dying and then they were told, no, you're not dying, you're not sick. This is just in, all in your head, it's just PTSD, don't worry about the asbestos in there and all this other crap, as literally I had people that I knew personally die. Uh, you can't not get emotional about that. When you're, in, when you're in front of somebody like Lord Jacob Rothschild or Henry Kissinger or Zbigniew Brzezinski, like I was eye to eye, face to face, when you meet those individuals, you cannot just be clear of emotions when you look into their eyes and you talk about them and you talk to them about Cambodia and the depopulation agenda and all the other horrible eugenics projects that they ran with medical experimentation on the American public and the public of the world. You cannot be emotional about these issues. I'm getting emotional about right, right now. <laughs> and and, and, and it, it's something yeah. that we, we, we shouldn't be scared of because it's real. It's a part of the human experience. And I think journalism is about sharing that human experience, challenging yourself and exposing people to the truer, deeper realities of the world from how you really see it instead of this bullshit corporate Disney World point of view that they want to regurgitate and shove down your fucking throats. Fuck that bullshit, wake up. And, and, and really live life through the fullest experience and the best way to do that is to be, is to be authentic as much as you can. Beautiful, amazing. Speaking of a lot of that, you just uh, uh, talked about a lot of very serious implications of a lot of the things going on here. A little bit. And uh, Whitney, I was very uh, interested to, to hear, um, I, 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 I find you to be one of the bravest people out there. And uh, I'm very thankful for the work that you. Seriously, seriously. Um, when you are calling out such a, uh, a, 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 a unified oppression in this coalition, um, that is, you are clearly calling out for being a violent and oppressive regime. Um, you know, there's a lot of seriousness there in that. And kind of, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you deal with both not getting burdened by the weight of the things you're implying and also dealing with the, the real reality of calling out uh, a violent regime. Okay, so I have, I have to say what's true. These guys are monsters and they need to be referred to as such. And I don't have any you know, problem doing that. I think some people may be self-censored um, to an extent, whether it's so they don't get demonetized or whatever. I'm not interested in that because, you know, uh, Personally, for me, it's because I'm a mom, but you know, maybe for other people it's different. But you have to call out the state of the world the way it is. Um, and uh, we're getting the rest of your question, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, how do you find optimism? Oh, right. In, in so, um, you know, uh, people a lot ask me if I'm like afraid for doing this work. I definitely don't feel that way because I feel like if you live your life in fear, especially of these people, you will never do anything about it. And ultimately, you know, if you're in a state of fear, uh, you are giving the people you're afraid of power over you and control over you at the end of the day, they're able to use, um, I mean, if you think about how this power system manipulates the public, there's like a carrot and there's a stick, right? Herding us into this digital CBDC doom corral. <laughs> so there's like, you know, the carrot is almost always convenience. Look right. how convenient it will be, you know? Well, prison's convenient too. They serve food to you and whatever, and yeah. They give, um, give you the shelter, yeah. Yeah, yeah you got a with. roof over your head, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, but the, the stick, what is that? It's almost always fear, right? And so even if, you know, I'm not gonna speak up because I'm afraid of these people, stuff like that, you know, then if everyone's afraid of them, no one's going to speak up, and that's exactly what they want. Right. And the way I feel about it is, fuck these guys. I'm gonna say uh, exactly what you are and what you're doing, um, because I mean, if we don't, no one knows, and uh, they win. And the whole point of what I do and what a lot of other people do is so these guys don't win, because them winning is not just the end of like human freedom, it's like the end of human existence when you're talking about these like 
crazy transhumanist dudes who were like, yeah, in a, in a hundred years, uh, humanity as we know it will be gone, and we're going to redesign you. Like, the f <laughs> no. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy to me to not say something about that because, you know, um, it, if we don't, then it just happens, right? And I think they've conditioned the public and trained the public to be as passive as possible and to sit back and do stuff. And, you know, we've outsourced so much of our responsibility and also our thinking to these guys. And the only way to fix that is to do the opposite, right? 100%. That's how I feel about it. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, give it up. Yeah, fuck those guys. <laughs> Uh, speaking of you know me cursing uh, on stage right here, um, Luke, I was I was curious about how you feel the importance of free speech uh, leading to like can you have informed consent in a democracy without a free press and free speech? And do we have free press and free speech if we have a journalist such as Julian Assange who all he did was reveal war crimes of the United States government? Uh, and the NSA spying on uh, citizens. Um, can you have a civil society without free speech? I mean, free speech is, is essential to obviously a free society. You can't have, you know, you, you can't have them without each other. And I, I tested that, especially during the beginning of my career, by going up and, and questioning a lot of powerful politicians and talking about their secret societies and ending up in jail and being arrested and being tackled and being assaulted and being intimidated and being uh, it, it, going through so much absolute just utter bull crap. But, uh, you know, when it comes to this larger concept, I do believe that also energetically a lot of these people, um, a lot of the very powerful people work on informed consent as, as a way for plausible deniability. And they do mm. allow some individuals to have some kind of speech as well, limited speech at that. But still, they, 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 they do release a lot of information. They do release a lot of symbols as well to kind of show people exactly what, what they're doing. There, there's, there's little tidbits of, of truth everywhere. And it's up to the individual to kind of look for it, find it, curate it. And I, I, I do believe it's more important than ever to, to use speech as we can because it's directly under attack. It's essentially been almost completely eviscerated, except for, of course, what's happening on a minuscule level on Twitter, which is even debatable because other individuals like Alex Jones can't even be on the platform. But still, we, we are doing our best. And, and I think the more of us that speak out, the more of us that are not afraid, the more of us that, that are able to stand up for ourselves and believe in ourselves, the better chance we have as humanity for moving forward towards a more freer society. Because right now we're moving, moving towards a total totalitarian one that's gonna control every aspect of your life. The technocratic machines, Mark Zuckerberg already knows when you take a dump. All right, that's too much information that they don't need to have on you. But when you have so much of your information, so much of your data going to these individuals, they, they use it in so many sinister ways that they are already influencing and shaping uh, dissidents and 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 they're already shaping your mindset in so many sinister sim, uh, uh, di different secretive shadowy ways that we, you kind of have to wonder even if we do have free speech how, mu how much of that speech is manipulated so we're in a big conundrum of holy cow they have a lot of power over us uh, let's just freaking say as much as we can before we are totally eviscerated totally shut down and I think uh, we're reaching a moment in, in time, especially in history, where you know the First Amendment is being challenged more than ever, and either it's going to be fully successful or it's going to be fully shut down. But that choice is up to the individual, especially with the conversations you have, especially with how far you want to push the Overton window, especially with how far you want to go with uh, just saying, hey, this is absolutely wrong, this is absolutely crazy, and this stops with me saying no. Amazing. Wonderful. And the more people that, you know, flex their free speech and stand up, it's very inspiring, and others are inspired to do that. And, of course, I can speak to that from my inspiration taken from you guys. Uh, Joe, I was, I was, you know, there's a lot of talk in the Bitcoin space about culture war and all this and that. And, and I, I was kind of curious if how you feel as a journalist, if it's your responsibility to sort of stick your flag in the ground and say, you know, this is what... I believe in this is what it is, or rather, is it like I should really just kind of be uh, presenting, you know, you know, just kind of telling it like it is, and sort of this transparency kind of removed from, uh, like, like, is it our role to direct the culture as journalists, or is it our role just to represent it? Interesting. 
just before we get to the Bitcoin culture war, just sharing the stage with two you know, independent established journalists, I think that rouses up in people something which they already knew was there, but it just highlights just how important it is. I mean, pre-Bitcoin me as a journalist was completely unfamiliar with all this. And the Bitcoin thing helped me to understand you know, more of the truth. I mean, it's written on your T-shirt. <laughs> written on your t-shirt as well, I'm <laughs> surrounded by it. And um, I think that, yeah, Bitcoin is one of these tools that helps people get there, but having these voices on stages like this is even more important, I would argue. Um, with regards to the Bitcoin culture, I mean, the first thing is that Bitcoin has a culture. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Right. <laughs> and it has really strong offshoots. I mean, we had wizards shouting at uh, normal Bitcoiners and Puritan Bitcoiners, and there's now progressive Bitcoiners. Are there's there normal whole... Bitcoiners? I don't know. Maybe, maybe. What, we'll mean, get there. <laughs> I mean, what Water's is normal, warm. right? I mean, yeah. I, I love as well that Bitcoin embraces the weird, and it's where you can find your truth and then you know be authentic and then build from that. And it's in a space where, to be honest, most people are accepted. If you are a Bitcoiner, then you're probably going to be welcome. And we see that with the fact that there are two presidential candidates from opposing parties sharing a room and sharing a stage. I'm not familiar, uh, familiar with US politics the way that you esteemed people are, but I presume that's not a very regular occurrence. It certainly wouldn't happen in the UK. So isn't that just testament to the fact that this free open source protocol is enabling people of all sides of the spectrum to come together, share ideas, and as Luke says, you know, practice their freedom of speech. Beautiful. You, you brought up the open source protocol and the, you know, the actual, you know, programmatic aspect of Bitcoin, something that's really interesting about it is it is a time stamping, you know, tool. Um, and, you know, Whitney, I was curious, you know, uh, you know, you run, you have your own website, you do your own publishing, you've, you've published these books with a publisher. Um, you know, how, how do you look at when you're speaking the truth like this, like the importance of the publisher or the medium as a way to actually get the, the words out? You know, you obviously you worked with a wonderful publisher and um, yeah, what, what is the importance and the role of, uh, you know, a publisher or an editorial as a platform um, to get voices out there, um, et cetera? And then so, you know, for me, I was approached by the publisher and I've, uh, I was familiar with him because he, uh, Daniel Estelin connected us. He interviewed me and said, you should turn this into a book. Mm -hmm. I've never written a book before. <laughs> yeah, it turned into two. <laughs> Is there a third coming? Uh? No, nah, don't ask right now. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's becoming very infrequent, the amount of like big established platforms that will actually allow people to speak their minds. I think that's very troubling and there's obviously a huge need for that. I mean, what I did, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff I've never really focused on, including like the financial side of it. You know, the way I approach it maybe is different from some people. Um, you know, I just figured if I put out content that was high quality um, and high integrity, and I just kept doing that, that the rest would come, I guess. Um, and before, you know, I depended on some other platforms, I guess, for financing my work, like Patreon. Um, that didn't work out during COVID, so <laughs> I decided, and, and what I've done since is I think a model maybe other people should follow, like the less middlemen you have, middle, middlemen that are involved, you know, the more you can speak your mind because when you have a bunch of other people in between you and your supporters, uh, they can cut that off, right? Like what happened to me has happened to a lot of other people. So, you know, the more resilient you can build your, uh, you know, website or whatever you're publishing, you know, the better off, off you'll be because, I mean, we are really under uh, an unprecedented siege on free speech. <laughs> it, it's really astounding. Um, but a lot of it I see is taking place mainly in the digital space. I think they're really neglecting print uh, to a big extent. Mm -hmm. um, so thank, thank God for you guys. Uh, but, you know, um, <laughs> It's really crazy to me, you know, if you think about what they, they've been trying to do, the fourth industrial revolution or whatever, they're trying to push everyone and everything into the digital as much as possible, why they're also at, in simultaneously making this huge control grab for the digital space, the infrastructure, what you can and can't say, surveilling it, all of that. So, you know, uh, I think people need to be cognizant that those are, that's a two-pronged thing. It's very intentional. And if you're going to continue like trying to publish and get the word out digitally, uh, you have to think about different ways to get around that. Um, and you know, like uh, I had a friend set up a BTC pay server for my site and all of that in case that you know 
PayPal and Stripe take me, right, <laughs> right. which is, you know, very likely. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't let that influence my worker again, like uh, make me fearful. You know, I think there's a lot of people in independent media that are fearful of being de demonetized. Like I've been on a few, um, I guess, bigger audience podcasts recently, and they've been like, well, we're on YouTube, but Whitney Webb's about to be on, so we're going to Rumble, or we're going somewhere, you know? But I mean, that audience needs to hear stuff, and yeah. if those big voices do get demonetized, maybe less people will finally start using an awful platform like YouTube, yes. you know? Yes, um, yes. <laughs> so again, you know, I think the self-censorship thing and all of that is uh, kind of destructive in a lot of ways to what, you know, I would like to see in independent media personally, and I think the more people take you know, responsibility for their own stuff and I including, you know, independent creators and, and journalists and stuff, you know, I think the better off we'll be in, uh, as journalists and as publishers and also for consumers as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, if, if I don't demonetize your podcast, I didn't do my job, you know, <laughs> frankly. So, uh, uh, you know, kind of running off that, Luke, um, you know, we talked uh, a few months ago and, and you know, I kind of just sort of just asked, you know, what, we, what, do we, what do we need to do? You know, how can I help? What can we do? And um, one of the things you said was, you know, we need to make sure that we, in, you know, incentivize investigative journalism. Yep. And um, how do we do that? <laughs> you need to organize by disorganizing and then essentially the, the biggest solution here is decentralization. Decentralization is the key. We're dealing with a lot of pressures, especially as journalists, as you were talking about, especially when it comes to demonetization. I felt horrible because I remember once going on the Ron Paul Liberty Report and I'm like, Ron, you know, maybe it's not the best thing to put my name in this YouTube video. And he's like, no, it's fine. You know, it'll be totally okay. And then he did, and then we did the live podcast, and he comes to me right afterwards, he's like, oh, we totally lost monetization here. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wonder why. Yeah. And for many years, I've been dealing with this kind of uphill battle, but I, I do believe, you know, a lot of people want to organize, a lot of people want to come together, a lot of people want to build one big kind of ship. If you have a big ass ship, it's going to be sunk. It's, it's going to have a big target on its back. Okay. That's why I think decentralization is key. I built my own platform. I built my own website. I really do hope we do get the full experience of free speech on social media, on Twitter, but I'm not, I'm not putting my eggs in one basket. I'm going to, of course, incentivize you know, my audience and my people where I want to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. I get to give them videos. I get to talk to them. I get to interact with them. I get to talk to them about health and do a whole bunch of really cool, fun projects on my platform, on my website where I get to control who gets to see it, who doesn't get to see it, and, and essentially it allows me to finally say whatever the hell I want. But the battlefield is also you know, on YouTube where the normies, the Kyles and Karens are. You wanna reach those people out <laughs> as much as you can. You wanna get them out of the matrix. You wanna slowly kind of incentivize them. And, and, I, and this is the way I see it as far as my kind of strategy here in this, in this media landscape is there's a lot of people who are totally conditioned, totally brainwashed. You give a little, you give a little, you know, give, give them a little bit of a, a, little, a little bit of that truth, you know, you kind of drag them in here, kind of take them in there, be like, you want to see a little bit more? Just, just come here behind this back door. And then you <laughs> take the, the tour hammer of yeah. and you beat them over the fucking head with it. <laughs> and then you go down the rabbit hole of satanic pedophiles and occults and secret societies and all these other <laughs> yes. fucked up shit and all these yes. demon motherfuckers trying to ruin your health the and, and seed oils beautiful. and high fructose corn syrup and all those other fucked up shit that they're fucking doing with the back seeds for fuck's sakes. And then yeah, awesome. you have a small pod of people like, oh, yeah, yeah, fuck that seed oil. I'm not going to be taking any yeah. experimental mRNA technology into my fucking veins. I'm not going to be sterilized. I'm not going to, you know, make sure my testosterone levels are fucked up. I'm, you know, so, so that's how it, that's, that's the solution. <laughs> Tanning your balls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Therapy. You heard it here oh, first. Nine yards. Don't tan your balls. It's actually sun, bad sun for you. Sun your balls. But it's that's that's, the that's how we that. fight the deep state, everybody. Tan your balls. <laughs> uh, speaking of the deep state, Joe, we all know mainstream media is a fucking joke. Yeah. And yet, there's still a way to kind of use it as a tool in this weird way to sort of, you know, pick up what is the narrative, the, the, the Hegelian dialectics they're trying to, you know, to, to, to get you to believe. Um, do you use mainstream media as a tool in, in sort of your like viewpoint, even though understanding it's very corrupted by you know, fiat economies and bad incentives? Well, so the interesting thing is that with the investigative journalism piece, well, this is something I really struggle with on a personal and you know, professional level, 
because as in the Bitcoin and sorry crypto space, there is very few. There's, there's not a lot of resources going into investigative journalism. Whereas you look, whereas if you look at mainstream media, there is still a lot of money flying around because they are the incumbents. They have all the power, and so. I mean, I do still consume some mainstream media and I do consume it as a way to get Bitcoin into there. For example, I was networking quite high at the Financial Times to try and get pro-Bitcoin content into the Financial Times because ultimately I'm driven by this mission of Bitcoin as opposed to a mission of sort of journalism. Um, but when it comes to the, the, the investigative stuff, there is still some really good content there. I mean, the, I don't support The Guardian. I don't really read The Guardian, but they did an amazing undercover doc in investigation into the royals and where their wealth comes from. Because as a Brit, you know, we've got this family, <laughs> which is obviously unelected, in this constitutional mon monarchy, which we didn't choose, we're born into, whatever. But we don't know how much they're, they're worth. We don't know what their possessions are. And technically their possessions are my possessions, our possessions. So th there are still some resources going into really good investigative pieces. However, on the whole, no, I canceled my time subscription in 2019. Yeah. I've stopped reading The Telegraph, I've stopped reading The Guardian, and the BBC. I mean, it's got some great explainers on Bitcoin, but let's be honest, on the whole, it's mostly a shit show. And, you know, canceling presenters of like TV programs, I don't know if this made it into American um, coverage, but they canceled a sports broadcaster who used to host a, a, a show talking about football, sorry, soccer. And <laughs> in, in, he then tweeted a couple of days later something mildly provocative and was canceled from his sports broadcast. So it's, it's just, we know it's a shit show, but it's still the ones that, that most people listen to. And if we can't meet people where they're at, then how are we gonna get them to finally you know, embrace and welcome this truth that we know is out there? Beautiful, beautiful. Well, we are sort of wrapping up here. This is the end of our panel, unfortunately. Um, I just wanted to kind of leave just with a, with a thought here that, you know, we are in a world where our, uh, our con you know, this regime of control and our, our, this coalition of oppression is very unified. Uh, and I think we as, uh, you know, journalists and as, as citizens, as plebs, have to make sure that our counter-revolution and our pushback against these things is also unified. Welcome. Um, and so I just really appreciate uh, the three of you taking your time to come here, um, doing the work that you guys do. It's incredibly important. Um, I thank you very personally. Um, and I know a lot of us out here, I'm sure, share the, share the same sentiments. You too. Um, <laughs> thank you for speaking the truth. Um, we need it. It's very inspiring. And um, I hope to continue uh, to see you all continuing to do uh, incredible work very safely. And um, yeah, keep being you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Bitcoin Magazine. Bitcoiners, welcome back to Bitcoin 2023. This is the Bitcoin Magazine Live Desk, sponsored by Marathon. I am joined once again by Rob Hamilton, Nico Moran, and Pete Rizzo. Getting right into it, unbiased journalism is BS, is what Luke said to you, Nico. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. And, and the sad part is that corporate media pretends like they're unbiased. But if you haven't been living under a bridge for the last two or three years, they're anything but, right? So it's that hypocrisy. And then I'll, I'll, I'll double down with this, right? Because they, were, they asked Joe Nakamoto, um, how could you be unbiased if you're holding Bitcoin? I don't, I don't think it's a problem, uh, you know, putting your own personal beliefs into your work. And the reason I don't think it's a problem is because Bitcoin has aligned incentives. So because you're talking about Bitcoin... All right, guys, that was a show on uh, the orange server on Rust. That was a journalism show on uh, Bitcoin 2023. Let me just pull up. Uh, Yeah, that was journalism on a Bitcoin standard. Mark Goodwin, Whitney Webb, Joel Hall, and Luke Rudkowski. Rudkowski? Probably butchered that. My apologies. It's a good show. Viewed it on uh, Rust Orange at the Citadel. Come on down, and uh, they're broadcasting all day. So.
Miss my turn. Alright guys, thanks so much for watching, and uh, we will catch you on the next one. Remember, stack them sats, and uh, come on down today and uh, check out the Citadel. They got the uh, Bitcoin show on there all day long. It's right, uh, right here on C11 to CE13. So, check it on out. Alright guys, take care, and uh, see you next time.